Okay, good afternoon. Welcome to uh, Medical Grand Rounds. We've got a small and mighty crowd here at Parnassus, and I think about 50 or 60 people online. So we will be speaking to all of them. Uh, today's a special day for a few reasons. Uh, every year we hold the Gurpreet uh, Dhaliwal Lecture. Uh, I want to make clear to everyone that Gurpreet Dhaliwal is alive and well, <laughs> sitting, uh, sitting here in the auditorium. Uh, this lecture was named after Dupree by, uh, by uh, Dupree by a couple of uh, uh, donors who were grateful uh, for him. And uh, not the rest of us have not donated uh, money, but we're all grateful for him. Uh, Gurpreet is a remarkable human being and an inspiration and a role model for all of us as we think about how to be, be better diagnosticians. And uh, so it's a really nice opportunity to honor uh, all of the things that he has done and, and, and will do for, uh, for the community here. Uh, it's also uh, part of our master clinician visiting professorship. So we started the master clinician program a number of years ago to honor our clinicians who provide exemplary care to their patients. Often we find ourselves honoring our educators and our researchers, but don't really give enough attention uh, to the people that take care of all of us. And these are the people that we consider to be our, the doctor's doctor, the people who you would go to for a problem for yourself or family members. Um, and as we look at the uh, legacy of the uh, Master uh, Clinician Program, it's really an extraordinary group of our faculty. Uh, this year, we honored five extraordinary faculty and went welcomed them to the group. Uh, they are uh, Nira Botka, uh, who uh, gave grand rounds a few weeks ago, Beth Harleman, Steve Hayes, Leslie Mia, and Hope Rugo, uh, amazing group of people. So for today's uh, Gurpreet Dhaliwal lecture, as I think about Gurpreet sitting here and Lisa sitting here, they may be the two people who have uh, done the most to improve uh, the way we think about diagnosis and gotten the issue of diagnosis in front of the public more than almost any other people I can think of. Uh, Gurpreet through his, uh, his own work and his lectures and his uh, a role modeling of what it looks like to be an extraordinary diagnostician. And Lisa, through her uh, work, at, in some ways, uh, bringing to public attention the importance of diagnosis and the complexity of diagnosis and, and the art, and in some ways, the joy of, of diagnosis, which uh, I think we all feel, particularly in internal medicine, but I think uh, Lisa's done more than anybody I can think of to make the public aware of what that means. Uh, she is an associate professor on the faculty of Yale University. Uh, she's had really a remarkable career. And when, when uh, students ask me, you know, should I go in, into medicine and be a doctor? It's a hard question to answer because there are so many flavors of what it's like to be a doctor. I think Lisa's career exemplifies how many different ways you can make contributions as, as a physician. Uh, she has uh, made contributions as a clinician. She continues to do that, and she now actually runs Yale's Long COVID uh, Comprehensive Clinic. Uh, but probably her greatest contributions come through her uh, work in writing for and, uh, uh, and, and speaking to uh, uh, lay audiences as well as professional audiences. Uh, she came by that, honestly, she was a journalist for a number of years before going to uh, to medical school. And in fact, she has an Emmy Award for her uh, journalism uh, in her coverage of Hurricane Hugo. But then lucky for us, she went to medical school and she uh, uh, did the usual professorial thing, but also continued writing and speaking uh, to the lay public, mostly in the topic of diagnosis and how to improve diagnosis. Uh, you will know her work in large part because she has uh, she writes the popular and uh, uh, long-lived column uh, called Diagnosis in the New York Times Magazine, which is must uh, must go uh, must do reading by uh, all of us. Uh, really explicating complex cases and how uh, how to think about this for the lay public. Uh, that uh, series ultimately uh, turned into or was an inspiration for the the uh, TV show House. Uh, which also uh, demonstrated what great diagnosis looked like, but also uh, a dysfunctional human being, which Lisa's not. And uh, she's also uh, uh, helped create the documentary series Diagnosis, which is on Netflix. Uh, her most recent book is called Diagnosis, Solving the Most Baffling Medical Mysteries, which is a collection of her New York Times columns. So uh, we're grateful to you, Lisa, for uh, coming and spending some time with us. So grateful to Gurpreet, grateful to our master uh, clinicians. And uh, uh, Lisa's talk today is on medical documentation in the electronic health record age, and uh, we look forward to hearing it. Lisa.
thank you for a generous, really generous and beautiful introduction. I just wish my mom was here. Um, it's really great to be here, especially after all this isolation. Um, uh, it's been an amazing visit so far. I've met so many fascinating people and I've stolen as much as I could from them, but I plan to steal more. It's also exciting to be speaking at Grand Rounds that's named after my good friend, Gapreet Dhaliwal. He's been an inspiration to me since the day I met him and, and I'm honored to talk to you under his aegis. It's also great speaking here at the home of some of the solutions to the problems that I'm gonna address in this talk. I'm gonna talk about the electronic medical record and how it has changed the way we do some of the most important things we do in medicine. Uh, specifically how we communicate, how we write notes. But first, is there anybody here who has worked in a system before the electronic medical record? Can, well, <laughs> okay, well, that's a surprise, okay. Somebody younger. But, you know, for, for most of you, um, uh, you've spent your careers in this EMR world. And let me just say that although there are things that need to be improved, this world is better. The EMR has made medicine better. Oh, no, oh, I finally got that. Sorry. Uh, if you've ever watched those old doctor shows, I mean, really old, not House, Dr. Kildare, Marcus Welby, you'll know that we used to keep track of our patients on little pieces of paper that we stuck into charts like this and held together with these very, very flimsy metal clips. We keep the language and even the image in Epic. You know, when you chart somebody, it shows a little teeny weeny chart, little paper folder icons that represent what charts used to look like. But this is the real thing. Thousands and thousands of pages containing problem lists and test results and lots and lots of notes. They were usually held together by these little metal clamps. <sighs> these things were so frustrating. Charts would get misplaced. You'd have to see a patient and you didn't know anything about them. You'd have to then write a note that would be God knows how gotten back into the chart whenever it was found. It was just a horror. The, chat, the charts would last the patient's lifetime. Sick patients might have dozens of charts, all stuffed with papers, more or less held in place. Pages would be lost, entire volumes would be lost. And don't get me started on the handwriting. Let me just say, doctor's bad handwriting is absolutely legendary. And I think that when it was first, when it was just used to write prescriptions, it kind of made sense. You know, we didn't have very, when this was the case, we didn't have very many things to, uh, to offer. And so scribbling it totally made sense. But then when we started to write notes, boy, I spent so many hours trying to decipher handwriting. In hospitals, the consultants or attendings would come by and scribble their notes. And of course it was up to the house staff to actually turn those into orders. Um, and we'd have to, have to figure it out. The unit clerics were our secret weapons, but if they couldn't read it, you were in big trouble. And sometimes you'd actually have to call the doctor and say, can't say, boy, your handwriting was so terrible, I couldn't read it. You would have to come up with some reason that you were calling. So nobody wants to go back to that. Certainly I don't. EMRs have made possible things that were absolutely unthinkable before we had them. We can check our own quality of care. We can find out how our internal medicine patients with diabetes, which ones of them have A1Cs that are at goal. We can implement a change and then recheck. That kind of data was inconceivable before the EMR. We can get a better understanding, not only of our patients, but our communities. That's exciting and valuable. But our fundamental job is taking care of patients when they're sick and come to see us. And right now, there are aspects of the EMR that are just not helping. They're actually hurting. So in the next 40 minutes or so, I'm gonna do a few things. First, I wanna tell you a little bit about where I'm coming from, although Bob's done a really great job of doing this and why this matters to me. And although I hope by the end of this talk, 
that this will also matter to you. Then I'd like to spend a little time with what we have, the little of the time we have together, ta taking you back to the origins of the medical notes that we write and what happened to it when what should have been the greatest thing in the world happened in medicine, the development of a tool that gave us access to the full picture of the patient, the EMR, and look at how it has affected the note. Spoiler alert, I think the EMR has impaired our storytelling ability in medicine. And finally, I'd like to focus on maybe, maybe how we can get it all back. So here's one thing I didn't know about medicine. I didn't know a lot of things about medicine, even though I covered it for many years when I was in, in, in the media. But when I started at Yale in 1992, I didn't know about the essence of diagnosis. What drew me to medicine was its narrative structure. What I loved about medicine was the stories we tell. Most of our communications are in the form of stories. That's how we teach everything. That's how we talk about things. Usually patient stories. And I'm actually violating sort of an unwritten rule in grand rounds because I'm not telling a patient story. And there won't be any patient stories at all in this talk because I'm focused on the doctor's story about the patient. There's another thing you didn't know about me. I almost went into urology. Yeah. The simplicity, the beauty of the anatomy just spoke to me. And of course I had a very charismatic attending. That's how all of our specialty choices I think are driven. So for my first clerkships, I was totally set. I was gonna bully my way through general surgery and become one of the first few female urologists. But then I did my internal medicine rotation and everything changed. I went to this meeting I'd never heard of called Morning Report, and my dreams of the OR just disappeared. I fell in love with the practice of using the story to solve a mystery. I was hooked on the H&P. So I write a column for the New York Times Magazine called Diagnosis. This is my first column. It was published in September of 2002. I started writing it just after my year as a chief resident. An acquaintance of mine called me and, and asked me and all the other doctors he knew and asked me, what, what can doctors write? And I'm like, oh my God, we write the best story and we write it a dozen times a day. It's so fabulous. Uh, and, uh, and it was a little detective story. And this is what I sold to the New York Times. And it took some doing, but uh, I finally persuaded them to let me tell that story. So I based my column on the h and P. I I love the structure. I love the fact that the story was presented in the same way every time so that you can anticipate and recall when a case was presented verbally. I'm still writing that column. This is, the, this is my column that just got put up uh, last yesterday or the day before. And I tell the story in a lot of different ways. Uh, house was one way. This was another way. This is a series I did for uh, Netflix. That visit to Morning Report has shaped my entire career in medicine and in media. And it's driving my interest in the medical note. Like every new generation, I thought that the way I found medicine when I arrived in 1992 it had always been this way. You might say, as I once thought, that the note structures use, the H&P and the soap notes, that they're reflections of how we think. And because of that, you might think that these traditions evolved out of our work sort of naturally. That's what I assumed. And so I was shocked to find out that these structures that we use, the structures that define the stories we tell were invented by one guy. His name was Lawrence L. Weed. Here he is. You can see that, uh, look at that computer. <laughs> That's all I gotta say. That's how old this photograph looks. Um, and although the note looks as if it were a reflection of our thinking, what Weed would say is that we have it backwards in a wonderful grand rounds that you can still see on YouTube Weed tells us, the practice of medicine is the way you handle the data and think with it, but it is the way you handle that data 
that determines the way you think, not the other way around. In the 1950s and 60s, Weed was mostly a research scientist on the faculty of several academic medical centers. And like almost all research scientists at the time, and now, he was required to attend on the wards a couple of months a year. And he was actually shocked by the way doctors documented their, what he considered applied science, both in the hospital and in their offices. So here's a sample note he features in his talks and in his books. Let me just say, looking at this handwriting gives me a little PTSD. Um, but there's a little system to this setup. You can see that there's a date and uh, the blood pressure, the heart rate and the weight over, here, weight over here on the left. And maybe that's a med list over on the right. Those scratchings in the middle, is, is, is that a plan? Did he have constipation? You can see that maybe milk of magnesia is at the top. I can't read the next one, but the third on that list is Ducalax. And lastly, Fleet's enema. Not surprisingly, oops. Not surprisingly, two days later when he comes back, he has diarrhea. I think that scribble is the plan. A month later, he feels pretty good. So this tells you the little story, but it doesn't tell you anything about who this patient is and what his problems are, what his issues are. And it wasn't just the outpatient uh, uh, notes. Um, Weed was kind enough to, to turn this into typewritten text. So it could be read it, it could be read, but let's just focus on the top two notes. Patient received, well, I can't read it here. Patient received 40 units of regular insulin yesterday because of a blood sugar of 44 urine sugars, got 2000 of MGES, Amgen yesterday, blah, blah, blah. Um, uh, oh, here, that's a, that you can read it a little bit better there. So still, you have no idea of who this guy is, I assume it's a guy, uh, what his, why he's in the hospital, presumably it's for his diabetes, but we don't know anything else about him. At the end of the month, this physician rotated off service and a new doctor took over and here are his notes. So these are notes that uh, spoke to Weed. He thought this was a way of doing it. And you see that he starts off with, uh, um, it's a problem-based list and it's very systematic, and it tells you the essentials that you need to know to care for this patient. This is the same patient. Um, Weed responded to this as any scientist might. He says, a double standard exists. We invoke discipline when we prepare the manuscripts concerning laboratory resource, and yet we abandon discipline when we write the final progress notes such as these on the care of the patient, and because of that, the care itself may suffer, but we can help students systematize their clinical experience by means of their clinical records. We can demand that they present the data they accumulate on each problem in a consistent, well-organized form, clearly delineated. He was totally right. And out of this observation came two of our most precious stories, the h &P, which is an adaptation of what he calls the problem-oriented medical record, and the SOAP note. Armed with these two structures, he became a one-man advocacy army. He helped set up two outpatient practices that implemented the systematic documentation. And then he and the two doctors he recruited set out to convert the world. And they succeeded. His two-part series published in the New England Journal in March of 1968 remains one of the most cited references in medicine. And acceptance was amazingly widespread and fast. And even though there were problems, doc documentation was clearly better AL after Larry than it was before. And that's where things stood when I started my residency and became an attending. Paper charts had their frustrations, but there was nothing else until there was. The first EMR was developed in 1972 by the Regan Strife Institute in Indiana. It was welcomed as a major advance 
in medical practice, but nobody bought it. It was very pricey and cost was, it was unthinkable until Barack Obama pushed the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act of 2009, which offered incentives to, to implementing the EMR. Now there are many, many versions of the EMR, uh, but currently EPIC is by far the most widely used. EPIC says that 78% of the patients in the United States have medical records in EPIC. DMR, as it was rolled out, was so much better than these old charts. It had many features that improved our notes. Templates for notes reminded us of stuff that needed to be documented and reinforced the order they were presented in. And we didn't have to wrestle with bad handwriting. Um, results and notes were never lost. And the patient's data was right there, ready to be viewed. It should have been perfect, but it wasn't. Because around the same time, charting and billing became linked and complicated. Starting in the 1990s, CMS asked doctors to justify their billing codes by itemizing a certain number of components, primarily of the history of the exam and medical decision-making. These are the cards that everyone carried, oh, sorry. Everyone carried all the time. So if you wanted to give, a, this is for, the new, for a new patient, if you wanted to give a certain code, you had to have this many components of the uh, HPI, this many systems, review of systems, this many past medical family history, physical exam. You had to have all those, even if the patient didn't actually need to have those things documented. Um, And so when the multi-million dollar investment in the EMR was made, many hospitals and other health systems wanted to make sure they could bill a visit at the highest and best level. They were paying the EMR's bill, so naturally they got what they wanted. So for the first 11 to 12 years of the EMR's life, from 2009 until very recently, doctors felt pressure to add elements to their notes that related not to the patient, but to the biller. So one result of this agreement between EMR builders and buyers was that we ended up with a bunch of templated notes that often, often seem to ask doctors to either lie or spend time unlying, undoing the lies the EMR was ready to tell on your behalf. There were all these built-in efficiency components, the review of systems, so that with one click of a button, you could document the 12-point review of systems you did. Really? You really did a 12-point review of systems? Uh, if, you did, if, if you did a more thoughtful and patient-appropriate review of systems, you had to either type it out old school or go through the shortcut and unclick the boxes that weren't true. A third possibility, and we all know that this happened, we could just turn a blind eye to the untruths and keep going. This, of course, was the most efficient way. And then there was the physical exam. With a touch of a button or two, you could have a full physical exam added to your notes. But did you really do all that? The lungs were clear to auscultation and percussion, really? <laughs> You really do full neuro exam. As an attending in reviewing the notes written by interns on the, on, a, on the team, there were times when I suspected that not everything in the note was true. And that was unsettling. Even worse, there were times when I was absolutely certain it wasn't true. A couple of years ago, I had a patient with scrotal edema. A couple of days of Lasix fixed that but he had other problems. But every day in the intern's note, he had himself in the, in the patient's room documenting scrotal edema. Thankfully, he did note that the scrotal edema had resolved, but I was pretty sure that the intern was not examining this guy's scrotum. Or if he was, he shouldn't have been. Using templated exams, or even worse, cut and paste exams seems to make accuracy a time sink. It makes it harder for clinicians and trainees to modify their exam based on the clinical course. 
Sure, you do a full exam uh, on the first day of, patients, of a patient's time in the hospital. But if you're still doing 100% exam on day four or five, I'm gonna wonder if you're really paying attention because your exam should be clinically driven based on the diagnosis and the patient's concerns and reports. The other possibility, of course, is that you are not really doing everything said in the note that you're lying. Well, it's the copy forward lie. It's not really a lie. The dot phrase lie. It's not really a lie. So the first phase of EMR note writing, both in the hospital and the outpatient setting, fostered two important, and I would say damaging changes. First, as I said, it encouraged doctors to document stuff that had nothing to do with what they knew about the patient or what had happened to the patient the day before or overnight or, or even what you were planning to do for the patient that day. So what is all the extra stuff doing there? It's such a pervasive problem. We have a name for it, of course, note bloat. There've been dozens of articles about note bloat and what to do about it pretty much the since the first day the EMR was adopted. The other problem is a little more insidious and a little more destructive. Far too often, we wonder how much of what we read is, off, is actually true. In a recent article on note bloat, one doctor acknowledged that, let's see, everybody knows which doctor's notes can or can't be trusted. I think a lot of us feel that way. I got involved in redesigning the note at my hospital a few years ago after a really disturbing conversation I had with a wonderful attending that I admire greatly. He'd been one of my attendings when I was a trainee. He was a wonderful teacher and a fantastic mentor. We were attending together and I was complaining about my intern's notes that were copy forwarded. You know what copy forward is, where you take yesterday's note put it in as if change the date and it's today's note. And then you go through to make sure that you can't get caught in any of that uh, inaccuracies. So uh, uh, we were attending together and I was complaining about my copy forwarded, interns copy forwarded notes, which were way too long and not that interesting. He looked at me and was kind of surprised. And he said, you read them? I haven't read them for years. He said, if the intern can't be bothered to write his note, I certainly cannot be bothered to read it. And how much of it is real anyway? I have to say, this was so uncharacteristic of this guy. I mean, I was shocked beyond words. I know he was tired and that's why he sounded so cranky. But beyond that, the interns who spend so much of their time writing these notes, to have their work completely ignored. I, I found that shocking, ignored and doubted. But I also realized that I felt the same way he did more or less. He wasn't reading the intern's notes and he wasn't telling them that he wasn't and he wasn't telling them why he wasn't. I was reading the notes, but I also was not telling the intern how disappointed I was, uh, uh, how, unsatisfying and how unreliable it is. I wasn't discussing it with them either. And I worried, are they gonna graduate from their residency and try to manage in the world of care with these terrible notes? After that conversation, I realized that I couldn't do that anymore. And I'll tell you about what I did about that in a minute, but first there's still the issue of note bloat. I'm sure I don't have to convince anyone here that note bloat is real and that it is a problem. But since, but there is now data documenting how much of it there is and what a big problem it is. So let me share some of that with you. I love this line. I don't know Alan Butler, he's the head of Epic, but he said, doctors are writing the equivalent of war and peace every nine months. That is war and peace. That's a lot. Um, the average US note is over 6,000 characters long. That's about 1,200 words. And depending on how many spaces, that is just under five double spaced pages of text. According to Butler's, doctors are writing the equivalent of war and peace. Is all that really necessary? 
Doctors outside the US don't think so. Outside the US, specialist notes. And let me just say, as bad as internists are, the specialists are so much worse. But outside the US, the specialist notes average 1,200 characters, one fifth the length of ours. And it hasn't always been this way. Um, a group of doctors and researchers at the Oregon Health and Sciences University reviewed 2.7 million notes written by 6,200 doctors across 46 specialties over the course of 10 years, from 2009 until uh, 2018. Over that period of time, they found that the median note length increased 60% from a median of 401 words in 2009 to 642 words in 2018. Median note redundancy, which they define as the proportion of text identical in one note to the patient's last note, increased from 11% to nearly, uh, from 11%, increased 11% from 47.9 in 2009 to 58.8 in 2018. And in 2018, when the source of the text could be identified, just 29% of the notes, let's see, yeah, just 29% of the notes was written directly and 70% was copy and pasted or copy forwarded or templated text. Not surprisingly, the more templated or copied texts there was, the longer and more redundant the note. These researchers calculated that for every 1% increase in the proportion of copied or templated text, it was associated with a 1.5 increase in, in note length. So it doesn't really matter if a note is long and repetitive. Of course, the writer in me thinks that it does. Um, and the doctor in me is in full agreement. Making people work to find out what's going on with your patient cannot be helpful. And there's some evidence that this is true. In one study, uh, 20 intensivists reviewed patient data in the conventional format, and then using a format that only included salient information. When using the conventional, that is the wordy redundant note, physicians made four times as many errors per subject and took approximately twice as long to complete tasks when compared to those using streamlined notes. Another study showed that physicians using the conventional format had to view more than two thirds of the information in the note more than once. They had to reread most of the note more than once compared to just 17% of the information presented in a streamlined format. It took longer to read, and this was surprising to my residents, and longer to write. Studies comparing conventional notes with all their copy forwarding and templated time savers compared with a streamlined note format with an emphasis on pertinent data that showed, uh, showed that streamlined notes were 25%, uh, sorry, were 25% shorter and were signed 1.3 hours earlier. Um, and we all know, and there's now studies to show this, that the later a uh, note is put into the chart, the less likely it is that anyone will ever see it. So that whole work that interns are doing, gone, doesn't matter. So using templated or templated, a template that encourages uh, writers to include only important data and actually type it in, uh, communicate the data better, they're faster, they're shorter, and you get out earlier. So after my shocking conversation with my mentor, I decided to do something about the notes in our, that our interns were writing. I started working with one of the residents who I knew was interested in this and we developed a new template. Let's see, maybe this is it, nope. Oh, this is important. Does it matter? Well, actually there was just a lawsuit that was, uh, was uh, resolved last year where one uh, 
urgent care center had to pay $2 million for fraud. And the Department of Justice in their press release said that documentation should be medically necessary to the patient's complaint and that performing a full review of the patient's history and a comprehensive examination may not be clinically relevant nor medically necessary. So they thought that some of the over-documentation that they saw was actually fraud and uh, it cost that, that company $2 million. So this is the template that we came up with. There's no imported data, all those three asterisks, I don't know if you use Epic or not, I, I think you do. Um, you have to write it in yourself. Um, so we, there's not a lot to see in this template because nothing's imported. It's all has to be written in. And it's just there to remind you of what needs to be. This is the, uh, this is the H and P. Um, here's the progress note. Um, in my institution, at least at the time, how to write notes and how to present these in the verbal, the verbal version of the note were taught to the interns by their residents. We didn't have a class in note writing. Um, and of course, residents, the residents that were teaching our new interns were taught by their residents and it goes back. And so all of these residents, <laughs> their notes were, went back to the time when billing was linked to how many stupid pieces of data you put in and not linked to the actual uh, patient itself. So most of these, most of the templates, most of the bad templates are filled with data that is automatically pulled in. Or when you look at, when you go to Epic and choose one of theirs, they're filled with data that is automatically pulled in, or they make it uh, easy to automatically pull in data sets not single pieces of data, but whole collections of data. What this requires is that you choose the data that you put in. And that's been shown to improve the note quality. And also, I think, the thought quality. When you spend your entire note writing experience trying to catch the errors from yesterday's note that you've brought forward, you're not thinking about the patient. You're not thinking about the patient today. You're thinking about how you can keep from looking foolish. That's a very different set of thoughts that you're having. So I presented these just as notes, templates, and added them to the EPIC uh, file. And there was zero uptake, <laughs> zero. And that's when we decided that we had to take over teaching it because <laughs> Clearly just having it available was not enough to overcome a culture that said, I'm doing it the way my resident tells me to do it because that's worked for him and that's gonna work for me. So we started teaching interns a class on note writing. And we had a couple of different classes. Every intern got it. And that was two years ago. And it's making a difference. It's making a difference. You know, the great thing about residency is once something succeeds for three years, and I don't think we're quite there yet, well, maybe we have a 50 or 60% uptake, but once something is there for three years, thus it has always been, <laughs> right? So if we can just keep moving it along, I think we're gonna win, but that's cause we're in a really small hospital. I mean, I'm part of Yale New Haven Hospital, but we're in a community hospital, this primary care residency program. We have only a few residents. So we're gonna get it through here. And then we're gonna say, this is the YPC way, the Yale primary care way of doing things and try to make it a source of pride. And then we'll, then we'll try to take on the other program. Um, the h and I think, was pretty well understood what it's there for and why all these things existed. But the SOAP note, the progress note, that's where a lot of the lack of understanding came from. Like, what is the point of a progress note? Um, well, of course, 
the point is that it it's a snapshot of a, po a patient at a single moment. That moment when you examine them that morning at 6.30 in the morning before, your, before rounds, it's a snapshot of then. And every minute it stays out of the chart, after that, it's getting, it's getting staler and staler by the second. So when you hold on to your note, as I did, until three in the afternoon and stick it in the chart then, thinking that now I've really told the story of the patient, you've just wasted all of that time. It's sad, but it took me, I didn't know, nobody told me. And so we make sure that our interns know that the, per the purpose of the soap is to be a snapshot of the patient as they were that morning. So some of the interns are concerned that the real problem with the soap note is that it only covers what happened since the last note. I think that's a good thing because we have all seen notes where everything, including this kitchen sink is in that, is in that note. Every lab, every sodium, every piece of radiology ever done, it's all in there. And you can't figure out what's important. And if you can't figure out what's important, that means that somebody, namely that intern, is not thinking about what's important because these notes are how we think. And if you're not writing a note that shows what you're thinking, you're not, possibly, you're not actually thinking. There are other, there are other programs that are doing the same thing. Um, this is uh, an NYU Langone progress note. They did a study showing that using this template made notes better, shorter, and a higher quality. Um, the hospitalists have the biggest issue with this because they often pick up a patient deep into the hospital stay and they feel like they don't really have time to review the whole chart. Is that a problem with the note? I mean, really, is that a problem with the note? I don't think so. I think that's a problem with a system that moves doctors around like so many pieces of, on a checkerboard dropping doctors in as if we were completely interchangeable and had the Borg mind. I don't get to, I'm not in charge of that. So I do think we have to accommodate the system as we find it. And we're still trying to figure out how to accommodate that. Um, but I hope it won't be in the soap note. The other issue that's come up time and time again is the sense that that the note had to contain certain elements that had nothing to do with patient care and everything to do with billing. And that is no longer the case. Starting in the 1990s, um, oh, let's see, I forgot something. Um, I'm just gonna skip that. Uh, starting in the 1990s, CMS did ask doctors to bill based on the number of required components in the note, but that was completely discontinued in 2021. And this is what you have to do here. The history that you include, medically appropriate. The exam, medically appropriate. They have more definitions of these things, but the overriding idea is that if it's important to how you thought about the patient, if it was important to how you see the patient and where the patient's gonna go and what they're gonna do, it belongs in there. If it doesn't, it doesn't belong in there. We've really just started to change, to try to change the medical note at my institution. I'm located at a small community hospital. Last year, I saw some buy-in on the note and this year, even more. The great thing about it, residency, is that it will become history once you get it past a certain number. If all goes well with this rollout, I'm gonna focus next year on the outpatient note. I'm working with one of the chief residents now on learning uh, one of Epic's best bell and whistle offering. It's what's called problem-based charting. I don't know if y'all do that here. I know Larry Reed would appreciate that because it's really his problem-oriented medical record designed for the outpatient world. But that is sauce for next year's dish. This year, we're still focused on getting inpatient charting up to snuff. The great promise, um, 
So there's some new, there's some new possibilities helping us to chart beyond these templates. Some of it's scary and some of it's kind of exciting. So uh, Doximity has, a, has incorporated GPT in making notes. And you can see note template for internal medicine and you just put in the medical problem and it will, and the patient's age and some basic information and it will generate a note for you. Kind of scary. Just makes it up. And you know, GPT turns out they're good at making stuff up. This I thought was a little bit more interesting. So now what people do is that they have scribes who take notes based on what happens in the room. But it does seem kind of silly or at least strange to augment our EMR by bringing in an actual human to do the actual work. So this company and, and other companies are doing this. Clinical notes that write themselves. Clinic notes that write themselves. Really? I mean, maybe, at least with this, there's a transcript of what actually happened and the note is formatted from the data that actually exists. So maybe that's, maybe that's gonna help us. Uh, Maybe <laughs> I'm kind of a Luddite, I guess, when it comes to things like this. The great promise of the EMR would be that it at least had the potential to tell us all about a patient. It's all right there, just a few clicks away. And really, that is such a tremendous gift. But we have to learn how to manage all that availability so that it works for us and for the patients we care for. So let me let Larry Weed have the last word. He said, in the beginning, the clinical clerk, the new intern and the practice physician, practicing physician are confronted with a, an apparent contradiction. Each is asked as a whole physician to accept the obligation of meeting many problems simultaneously and yet to give each the single-minded attention that is fundamental to developing and mobilizing his or her enthusiasm and skill. For these two virtues do not arise except where an organized concentration upon a particular subject is possible. That's the goal. Thanks very much. Questions? I will use this one. Let's see. Thank you, Lisa. That was, that was terrific. Um, I think you implied this in your last statement, but it strikes me that the note is almost an impossibility because there are so many masters. And, and in some ways, I'd love to hear you think a little bit more about who, who and what is it for? Do you imagine it's for you to remember what happened the next day, your colleagues to see what's going on, uh, malpractice prophylaxis, billing, quality measurement. Is that part of the problem? It's got so many different parties who have different lenses that makes it almost impossible to come up with a coherent way of organizing it? I don't think it's impossible. <laughs> I don't think it's impossible. I do think that there are lots of functions, but I think the most important function, especially in a residency program, is to help residents and doctors in general think about their patient. The purpose of the note is to help you think about a patient and formulate your ideas so that you can move forward with the plan for the day and the next day. Um, and I think that a good note will tell the story of a hospital stay. For, I get, because I write my column, it used to be every two weeks, thank God, now it's just once a month. Um, and I would see notes from all over the country. And there were so many times when I would look through a big stack of charts or notes 
and have no idea what was going on. That it was just not clear what the thinking was, what the plan was, it was just data everywhere. That doesn't help anybody. I think that all of those markets for this note would be improved if the note had a clear function, which was the, for the progress note, to tell what happened since the last time I wrote this note, since the last note was written. That's what, and what we're gonna do today. That's the purpose of it. And I think if it actually lived up to that purpose, that would satisfy everybody. Yes, one more and then I'll open it up. Uh, by the way, the, I, I think you missed what to me was the most memorable part of the paper chart, which was you pick it up sometimes and a post-it note would, would flutter out <laughs> to the floor. Do you remember those? <laughs> oh my God, there was something crucial on that post-it note that was actually stuck in the chart. And crazy. you don't have any idea what page it was on. What page it was on, whose, whose chart it was, you just kind of stuck it back on some chart. Uh, you made the point, I think quite legitimately, that we may be entering an era where the doctor and patient has a conversation and that ends up becoming a note and the technology obviously is getting better, better very quickly. It's like, as I kind of process one of your points, which is the note as a, a thought provoker, the opportunity for you to take a break, slow down, think about what's going on and then consolidate that and articulate it. Can you think of ways that the computer could actually help us do that more than simply documentation? And I'm thinking about a future world where the computer suggests to us this, what you've told me or what you and the patient talked about is compatible with these five diagnoses or other things. What do you see as the benefits and downsides of the computer providing actually more real decision support as opposed to just documentation? I think that would be fantastic because of course, you know, when I, I used to talk a lot about diagnostic error and, and diagnostic excellence and I, I, I would say to people, you know, we have solutions, read more, use Isabel, but of course nobody does that. Nobody does it. Capri so, does that, but that's, well, I think he's the only one. <laughs> he is the only one. And that's why, you know, that's why this is a lecture named after him. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, I mean, I, I think that it's, that the computer can help us. I mean, they could prompt us. Do you have a new sodium? Is there, you know, has the patient had an x-ray of their hip? You know, I mean, I think that they could prompt us to think about the things that this computer who already sort of knows sort of the algorithm that we're working with can prompt us. And I think also suggesting uh, possible diagnoses. That's why I wanted people to look up things in Isabel. That's why I subscribe to Isabel. Mm -hmm. uh, I would subscribe to something else if I thought there was anything better. But I think that having a, a computer do it for us, because of course you have to stop what you're doing and think, wait, do I have any other, do I have any Am I, is what's the uh, level of uncertainty I have when I have only you know twenty more minutes? Right, that's the goal that you actually don't have to think about that or enter it some other place that it would come to you on your epic screen and make and prompt you. Yeah. Yes, help you think it out. So you would like that if that happened? I think so. Right. Although I, 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 you know, I kind of hate computers, but you know. <laughs> All right, let's open it uh, to any questions or comments. Yeah. Peter, say who you are. Uh, hey, Pete, oh, as I step all over my food, uh, Peter Barish, hospitalist. Um, Bob, I think I'm stealing this from one of your talks about the EMR probably, but I'm, it's, it's, it strikes me that we, d despite all of the advances in sort of documentation and the EMR, that we really are, we have really just scanned something that used to be paper and put it in the computer. And that is, a pretty limited way of looking at medical documentation. And you could imagine, I mean, so many other ways that you know we might document rather than really just writing something, scanning and putting it in there. And that's today's note. I'm I'm wondering at, you know, if there's any, if anyone else is doing this in a different way that's like radically different from the way that we're thinking about notes that might, you know, make it so that the daily progress note could be more like a neurosurgery note where it's just like no surgery today, maybe surgery tomorrow, you know, and that's what. To a certain extent, what you need to know, right? It's like, is the patient going to the OR today? Like, nope, you know, this is, we're getting these labs. Um, but then maybe some of the medical decision-making and thinking is, is somewhere else. I, you know, I don't know if you- I've never heard an internist argue that our notes should look more like a neurosurgery <laughs> note, so. Never, never. And in fact, there was a, there's one study that looked at not neurosurgery, but ophthalmology. And uh, all of their, when they were finished learning about how to make a better, 
progress note, their notes were longer. Still not as long as an internal medicine note, but longer. Um, so I'm not sure that that's really what we need to know. I mean, what we need to know about patients is so complicated. You know, there's a lot of things that we need to know about patients, and I'm just not sure that one line is going to do it. On the other hand, writing a volume doesn't make sense. I mean, when we had hand cramps from writing, you know, notes in charts, it helped us get our minds around what needed to be said. And maybe if we could please just get a cramp whenever we went over, you know, 2,000 words. It could shock you, yeah. <laughs> Uh, one of my like uh, one of my co-residents, his his, his uh, ideal note was feeling well and doing swell. <laughs> <laughs> but I think Peter's question sort of implies uh, I'll take uh, I'll extend it a little bit that the note, even in your idealized world, is still a piece of paper under a tab. And when we look at documentation in our new world, if you were building the note today, you would use as your inspiration a, a Facebook wall or a Twitter feed or a Wikipedia shared collaborative note or Google Docs, you, it, it would have audio, it would have video, it'd be much richer than a piece of paper under a tab. So can you- You think... are so right. That is such a great idea. All I right, there we go. <laughs> I love that idea. Let's do that. Yeah, okay, let's do it. Uh, Rebecca, say who you are. Hi, I'm Rebecca Berman. I'm the Medicine Residency Program Director. Thanks for this talk. Um, I'm sure our house staff are thrilled to hear that shorter notes are better, and I couldn't agree more. Um, I'm thinking about the purpose of the note. If we, like Epic is a billing system, and there's a lot, a lot of clicks in it. So it sort of encourages everyone to add more to their note. Has there been thought in working backwards from what we actually need in a discharge summary? Like as a PCP, I need to know the Lasix dose and their dry weight and really nothing else. And so is there a way to sort of use what we need at the end to help people figure out what to include in the middle? That's a really interesting question. I don't know. I, you know, I, I think that, you know, in our system and probably here too, Residents start on the discharge summary the day the patient is admitted. So it's not like they're not thinking about the day of discharge, but it doesn't, you're right, it doesn't seem to have a lot of impact on what, on what patients or what residents write about the patient that day. And in fact, if anything, the bad things about the SOAP note have now been transferred over to the discharge summary. And we have all sorts of really terrible, useless information in the discharge. Something that used to be clean and elegant and straightforward has now become lumpy. <laughs> in some ways, though, also asking for a customer-centric note that, that actually, what does the consumer of this note actually need and work back in your design from, from that. That's an interesting idea. Uh, Rita. Thank you, York. Rita Redberg, I'm cardiology and editor, JAMA Internal Medicine. And thanks for a great talk and insights. And I don't like computers either, but they're, <laughs> they're not going away. Um, they're not going away. But as we know, and sort of building on what Rebecca said, a lot of the note I think is for billing, because certainly it used to be that it was just to remind me, you know, what, what happened. And in my clinic notes, you know, I would always write things about the appearance of the patient because then I would remember exactly who it was or like what they, and now that we share everything and I'm like, I, I'm so afraid of offending anyone. <laughs> but so in my ideal world, this is, it, we get rid of fee-for-service medicine, have everything capitated, and then we could have really short notes. So that's what, and this, I, Eric, I know we, we were getting a lot of stuff at JAMA. I am, of course, on how chat GPT can replace or help us with note-taking some of from our own house staff. And I don't know if Eric's been looking at that, if you want to comment on it. <laughs> Hi, um, happy to talk. Uh, good to see you, Lisa. Yeah, I'm an editorial fellow um, with Rita at JMIM. We met some years ago. I used to be at Penn. I founded that writing group, the Gowanabees. We all came to your house once. Jack had just started on Civil, I think. Oh so my was, God. Yeah, it was a while ago. Wow, okay. Yeah. Um, That's my husband. And yes. And this fabulous Jack podcast hit. called Uncivil. Fantastic audio Civil War you've never heard about. Really would recommend it. Um, so, good to see you again. Um, as far as ChatGPT, I guess the thing that was interesting about the that aid, that's whatever that was called. Um, the dictation aid is that, you know, it's, it's, it's sort of effortless for ChatGPT to like pull that, those kind of features out of um, transcriptions and then kind of put them into a summary. 
Um, the challenge is these things called hallucinations in which um, the, the chat GPT software, because it basically just guesses sequentially words, will invent um, just facts about the patient's case that actually don't appear in the transcript because those are probabilistically featured in other similar cases. Um, we're about to publish something. I think it's fine. We're about to publish something that basically shows that patients age in, and, and in some cases gender are the most common hallucination. So you may chat with a patient. I don't often say hello, 33 year old male or something, but in your transcript, something like that might come up. Um, other than that, sorry, briefly, uh, three unrelated comments just sort of from the field of uh, being a resident. One, I'd be interested in the history of the handoff, especially as more programs switch to day night. Um, residents tend to communicate really outside the medical record and your comments about it being a way of organizing thinking, I think is really interesting, but as a tool to truly communicate pr between providers, there's a sort of like, like a, a black market of information exchange, which is now featured in Epic, which is basically a series of boxes. Right. Um, sign outs. Yes, sign outs, and they are sloppy. It is hyphens with um, events of the day, um, whether or not a consultant saw them, medication changes. It's just sort of this hodgepodge of information and then boxed to do's, like things to do. So it's sort of just a hyphen post tense something and then box future tense. To me, that seems like a perfect note. If all those things were in the right spot, that's all you really need. Because that's what the note is for, is to communicate. Here's where we are right now. Here's what needs to get done. I don't think that that's a hodgepodge. I think that's the real stuff. Just the stuff that matters. All the rest of that stuff. There you go. The whole note should just be the sign up. <laughs> Lisa, thank you so much. This is terrific. Thank you for visiting us.